Hello, and welcome to the TIFO Football Podcast. I am Joe Devine, and uh, I'm joined now by Seb stafford Bloor. Hi, Joe. Hello, how are you? I'm very well. So, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's miserable outside, so it's, um, it's dampened my mood a little bit. But this was fun. Sure. Well, it's lovely inside because uh, we've just been speaking to Rafa Honigstein, one of the coolest guys. And one of the most interesting, actually. We um, Obviously, we've theoretically the Bundesliga is a couple of weeks away from, from restarting and we um, we found out about all the sort of the mechanics behind that and the logistics involved and uh, it's just a much more complex situation than it would be in England um, and actually we were talking this morning Joe about this on, on the phone about how by going first the Bundesliga obviously has the potential to attract a, a very very large uh, audience on on television but also runs the risk of putting themselves front and centre of a sort of footballing vulgarity if that makes sense the kind of football's, football's belief that it should uh, insert itself into the um in, into into the conversation. Uh, well, this is this is why it was useful to talk to Rafa because some some yeah. much needed context I feel that we got from Rafa. Firstly, being you know the main thing of interest that I think he said in that regard was uh, to discuss the fact that all companies you know whether you're a car factory or you are a, a restaurant are making preparations for reopening at the earliest opportunity because they're screwed right. So it's an interesting and we you touch on the idea that football sort of gets a negative press around these things. Other things we discuss the meetings April thirtieth uh, May the 6th the uh, the German government are going to be discussing uh, the return of Bundesliga so it's possible that we will know by the time you're listening to this it's possible that we won't but the idea is for the Bundesliga to return at some point in May we talk about the motivation we talk about what the difficulties are we talk about how the testing works what happens if three or four players uh, uh, test positive for the coronavirus could, could that derail the whole league we also talk about the difference between the Premier League and uh, the Bundesliga and also the you know from a non medical perspective the responses of the UK and the German government and why it's possible for the Bundesliga to potentially start in the middle of May while Project Restart the Premier League sort of dubbed name for bringing its football matches back uh, is looking at early or mid June what's the difference there and finally we discuss could this open the door Da, 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 to a European Super League uh, because uh, Borussia Dortmund's CEO has been talking about how um, well complicated the financial difficulties that Bundesliga clubs could suffer are and Rafa points out a statistic during this episode that says that were the most recent TV payment not to have been agreed to be made uh, 13 out of 36 Bundesliga clubs that's the top two divisions could have serious liquidity problems that's terrifying so we ask with that in mind uh, could there be a break way at the top to try and keep the cash rolling in have i missed anything seb i don't think so you know what was interesting joe is that i i went into the conversation with a with a, a premier league mindset thinking that the, the bundesliga was being a bit gratuitous um but i think i i have an understanding for kind of the some of the necessities and the imperatives within the situation um and I also do better understand the, the, the television model which supports the Bundesliga as well, and that's really helped. And Rafa did a great job of explaining that. Yeah, you're a big convert. That's what you're saying. Anyway, listen, uh, Rafa Honigstein, Jonathan Harding, other fantastic guests and contributors on the Steilcast, which is the Athletics Bundesliga podcast. I listened to two episodes yesterday in preparation for uh, this conversation. And golly gosh, boy, oh boy, that's some fine listening, isn't it, Seb? <laughs> it sure is yeah you when, when you do That's things true. like that I, I tell you when you do things like that those have to go on the uh, on the schedule uh because you cannot you cannot just throw a golly gosh into our into our ad lib and expect me not to react to it <laughs> well listen i mean it though i honestly i think that, that it might actually be my favorite athletic podcast now there's quite a, there's quite a number up up and about there but um it's still right and also with its with its super cool german electro music at the beginning with raffa's dulcet tones i feel like i'm sort of in the corner of a of a nightclub in berlin in the in the 90s and the walls just come down and i'm having a great time and i'm off my mind on drugs you know not that but i mean i do really like the podcast so you should go and listen to it they're freely available by the way you don't have to be an athletic subscriber to listen to the podcast you can find them on apple or all of the other podcast providers any one of your choice you can find them um but you should become an athletic sub subscriber and do you know what if you're not sure whether you want to you've got 90 days to find out with a 90 day free trial if you visit the athletic.co.uk forward slash 
TIFO90, that's the numbers 9 and 0, you can get a 90-day free trial and, uh, you know, read all of Rafa's work and indeed all of the work from everywhere all over the place. Not just limited to football either. Ten other sports. It's, it's, do you know what? I don't say this normally, but it's f***ing cool. Isn't it, Seb? No, I, I, th- I think we should just let that hang. That was, that was a, a perfect outro. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, well, listen. It was was strong. It was good. That's That's all from us. That's all of our strong stuff. Anyway, here's Rafa Honigstein explaining all of the things that we asked him to about the Bundesliga to us and to you. Enjoy. Rafa, how how is the Bundesliga coming back? The idea is to come back... um, with normal home and away games according to how the fixtures would have originally looked so no neutral venues but the actual stadiums being used um, they also want to follow the existing um, schedule as much as they can meaning that uh, there will only be regular kickoff times on weekends and maybe the odd uh, midweek game but not nothing more than that um, provided they can start sometime in May and of course there's a huge emphasis on having the maximum risk averse setup as far as the players and the staff is concerned so a very finite number of people allowed into the ground about 300 but only 100 each in three different zones players are being kept apart as much as possible even before and after the game uh, even when it comes to showers and, uh, and changing rooms and handshakes before the games but of course once the game kicks off then it is business as, as usual probably uh, there's some suggestion that somebody wants them to play with masks I don't think that is viable. And of course, a, a very strict testing regime, which uh, will see players testing and being tested regularly, uh, probably twice a week. And then um, they're hoping to isolate cases quickly enough for not the whole team to go into quarantine, because at that point, of course, it becomes very, very difficult. Right. And I mean, can I ask then, we saw this morning in the news that uh, the Premier League is sort of, a, a, has, has dubbed its uh, restart project. Project Restart is the name of this. They're looking at the beginning of June as a, as a possible restart time, which um, which is a, a whole month after the Bundesliga. This, I realise that the answer to this question might in, involve non-footballing factors, but how is it that um, Germany has got itself together to do this a month before the UK? Well, first of all, I, I must say I'm a little bit disappointed with that project rename. I expected something a bit more <laughs> dramatic, like Project Green Thunder or sure, yeah, Black yeah, yeah. Dawn or something. You know, <laughs> the Premier League more... is much better at branding than that normally, isn't it? Usually yeah, has, uh, it, it sounds a bit it, um, underwhelming. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> to answer your actual question, I think it's a reflection of Germany off the pitch, just being slightly ahead of the curve, um, certainly in comparison with the UK. Um, the cases are going down. The mortality figure is relatively low. The lockdown is being um, eased uh, to some extent. You know, small shops are reopening. Um, there is a return, not to normalcy, but a return to a more um, normal um crisis scenario if you will so i think the assumption is that by the time the league will be allowed to come back with closed game doors uh, closed door games rather um by you know mid-may maybe late may that it'll be in line with the changes off the pitch and that there will be maybe the odd restaurant uh, open again certainly most shops should be open by by then so what looks now very much sort of almost futuristic and, and and hugely optimistic in terms of how football could come back is i think seen in the wider context of perhaps not then being that outlandish by the time it does come back some public normal life should have resumed as well in germany mm, okay um and i sp- i read in your excellent piece uh, about this on the athletic by the way um that germany has conducted something like or has the capacity to conduct over eight hundred thousand uh tests a week um i know that none of us here are medical professionals and or doctors but uh would the bundesliga's view on this be that i suppose the, the crisis management from the country country generally which to be honest in the uk has become a bit of a cliche to expect germany 
Germany to be better at everything in this regard. Is it that that kind of approach that has enabled the Bundesliga to, to or theoretically restart earlier and as a result of you know keeping the mortality rate much lower than it is in the UK, do you think? Yeah, these things are all connected and I think it is only possible to come back when the testing regime uh, of the league is not seen as as a burden to the overall testing. And uh, they've been at pains to point out that their overall demands for a whole season to finish would amount to, would amount to about 20,000 tests, which um, if you extrapolate from the number of tests possible a day uh, and they expect testing to be ramped up by, you know, by May and by June, would count to less than one in hundred, maybe only half a percent, and they think that is um, that that is negligible and that it is um, morally not insensitive enough to persist with that. Of course, the optics still aren't great. There are a lot of people in healthcare, there are a lot of people living in uh, in cities without a great logistical setup for you know for testing, who have problems getting tested. And uh, the issue there is not so much capacity, but actually the uh, logistical challenge of of getting uh, people to test you to come to you or getting towards these uh, testing scenes. And there is still, I think, a bit of resistance on the ground against this idea that Bundesliga will take up sort of kind of special special case in Germany we say extra wurst right um, extra sausage um, <laughs> you know being in a position where you demand something that you're not really entitled to and I think that is a concern that the, the league are very sensitive to I, that's, I mean I suppose just to put that in context as well were the Premier League to attempt to uh, to recreate what, what the Bundesliga is doing they'd be asking for significantly more extra sausage because uh, UK testing capacity well not just the capacity as you point out also the logistics I think the UK capacity of testing at the moment is, they say, 45,000 a day or something, but it's coming in at much, much lower than that. In some cases, uh, less than half of that. So I suppose that uh, sort of percentage figure would represent a significantly higher number of Premier League footballers taking tests than it would uh, in, in Germany. So there's something interesting there. Let me ask you this hypothetical question, though, Rafa. If uh, a player or two or three from one team do uh, test positive after the football starts again in the Bundesliga, what happens then? What, what if what if a team loses three of its key players? Is, is, could that or something as sort of contextually small as that within the grander scheme of things? Could that derail the whole project? That is a question that hasn't really been fully answered. Now, the concept that the league have put forward says if this happens, we don't necessarily have to send the whole team in quarantine and the game can still go ahead. And we treat this player testing positive as a player who's just pulled a late hamstring in the warm up. Um, The idea being that if you test positive on a Friday night, Saturday morning you get the result, but everybody else is still negative, then there is no reason to quarantine the other guys who all have just tested negative. Now, what happens, you know, three days later when some of them might also be positive is, is a big question. And uh, so far, the league have said, look, at that point, it's not really within our hands anymore because with every positive test, you have to register it with the local health authority and they then have to decide based on the available ed- evidence of how much contact there had been, etc., what happens with these contact uh, people. And uh, that is the great weakness, if you will, of the concept. It, it kind of almost... Um, assumes that everybody because of the testing going on all the time will continue to test negative all the time but i think there's a big assumption there and we don't know what would happen if half a team were to be testing policy positive you know will they just miss a game or two or will the whole league go on hold it's it's the sort of the big void at the heart of this concept i think Okay, let's say, Rafa, that uh, the Bundesliga does start and it's a success and uh, the potential, uh, the the issues around the virus or infection rates are kept relatively low and they don't impact teams and... uh, everyone's going to be watching it presumably I mean I know we I had the story I spoke to um, my friend James Montague about uh, the Belarusian League which I think might even still be going now but we were talking about it at the time as, uh, as the last league standing if the Bundesliga were to start again it would be the first major league to restart what could that do uh, for its global appeal given that people all over the world are desperate to watch top level football and presumably would tune in to watch even you know a normal midweek Bundesliga game well I think it would um deliver some 
some attention and it would deliver some eyeballs i think a lot of people would tune in because there's nothing else going on i think a lot of leagues of course would as you said take their cue hoping that what the bundesliga do, do, do will be successful and can be replicated and maybe sort of act as a um, as a pressure point um, to maybe sway the odd government here or there or the odd minister to provide a bit more leeway for football to come back in those respective countries. I don't think it would necessarily have a long-term effect for, for the league because I, I hope and assume that most football will come back at, at some stage. But of course, in the in the short term, I think it would, I think internationally more than domestically, would act as a signifier that the Germans sort of have their thing, have their act together and uh, in football and non-football. And I think it would it would be seen, I think, as a kind of a prestige um, win of some sort, you know, to be the first country, the first major country to bring football back. But I think this might be a short-lived um, effect. And I don't think necessarily that the domestic fans would be hugely impressed. I think they're more concerned with not being at the games and with football perhaps having its priorities wrong by coming back when the fans are still not allowed in. Yeah, I mean, can, can I ask you specifically about that and how uh, fan groups have uh, reacted to the proposal? I mean, I listened to you talking on the Stylecast about... Um, obviously all of the fantastic work that the ultras have done in Germany recently and ultra fan groups have, have done generally uh, in, over the last couple of months, uh, be, you know, things that relate to social responsibility. But there's also been some negative uh, feedback towards the idea of the Bundesliga restarting at this time, hasn't there? How, how do we summarise that? I think from a, um ultras or fans point of view, these things are not a contradiction. They would see it one as the extension of the other. They feel that uh, it's irresponsible to restart while there is still a crisis going on. They feel that uh, football puts itself sort of above the concerns of of regular people, um, above health concerns. And uh, they feel that it also um, sort of is, is a ugly window into the priorities of football um, the fact that they have to come back for TV money and basically just try to get these games out of the way um, hell or lever while, uh, while the fans and uh, everybody else can't really enjoy the game properly having to, to watch it at home Rafa can I um Sorry, just, just, just because otherwise, if I jump in later, I'm going to drag us back about 10 minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask about the nature of um, the different health authorities in Germany. Because obviously in the, in the UK, we're used to government decrees and a national position on something. Has there been a, a, a difference in perspective between the different regions over when the Bundesliga should restart? Yeah, I think it's important to understand that Germany as a federal country is organized um, along federal lines, which means that the local states have authority in certain matters and health is one of them. So um, it's no um, use for Angela Merkel or her health minister to say we are banning all football games. They can sort of uh, make a suggestion. They can put some pressure on the local governments to do so, but they are, uh, they are independent enough to decide for themselves and while it's too early to say if you know the views will be uh, diverging when it comes to bringing football back this certainly was an issue when football was still going on because on the last weekend of scheduled games in Berlin the local health minister's ministry said well in Berlin we haven't had that many cases we don't have a problem Union Berlin against Bayern can go ahead whereas in North Rhine-Westphalia and Bavaria the health ministers were saying no uh, these games can only be staged behind closed doors um, of course all these games were eventually postponed when uh, when the crisis really started to to accelerate that uh, that week but i think that gives you sort of an um uh, a feel um for for what the situation is like which is um beneficial in some respects but also makes finding a unified view slightly more complicated if um if, if one of the health authorities said right well we're not going to allow uh, even behind closed doors ghost games to, to take place in our state would that mean that the team from within that region was prohibited from taking part outside of it or would it just be a question of ensuring that the the behind closed door games took place in other parts of germany yeah they, they couldn't stop teams from the state traveling to other places in germany where it is allowed to play it's one of the reasons for Werder bremen who are in their own state as sort of a city state of bremen have actually looked around to uh, grounds in uh, the uh, the neighbouring uh, state 
to see Schleswig-Holstein to see if maybe there'll be alternatives if Bremen actually do, you know, have a tougher line on, on Bundesliga coming back. So it's a great question. And the answer is that um, it'll all depend on what exactly the, the ministers will say, whether, whether they find a, um, a unanimous view on this or whether there'll be huge differences and some people in the South, some people in North Rhine Westphalia saying, yeah, we don't have a problem. And others saying, no, at which point, of course, the scheduling will have to be adjusted. Let's talk about the timeline going forwards, if we can. So we know that there are two meetings upcoming to discuss this, one on April 30th and one on May the 6th. What exactly um, is being debated at, at those meetings? Who's talking about it and what needs to happen before the football can, can officially return, Rafa? So the April 30th meeting has long been seen as a crucial date for German football because that's when the uh, local ministers, the local sort of um, people in charge at the federal level um, convene in a conference um, with the government to decide on the latest sort of lockdown measures. This is not just about football, but a lot of people have been looking um, towards that date to, to get a real steer of what football can do and when it can come back. Now, um, all the noises we've heard in the, in the days leading up to this meeting is that a decision on football itself should not be expected, that they might just defer for another week, which is where the 6th of May date has come from. Um, I think it just reflects a bit of unease um, at a lot of um, local government level um, to not push these lockdown uh, easing measures too fast and I think there's a symbolic um, value attached to football yes people wanted to come back at a certain extent politics by by and large I'd say is behind the idea of bringing it back but they're also wary of sending the signal that now life is back to normal and you can do whatever you want and I think just playing for time and waiting just for another week to assess the situation is probably the compromise that they'll go for at this moment in time. Yeah, it's interesting, actually. I'm thinking, uh, so obviously in, in, in the UK, football has been in the limelight in the last couple of months, mainly as it relates to um, making use of the UK government's furloughing scheme. So paying 80% of, uh, of the wages for mostly non-playing staff. There are a couple of clubs that have taken this up. Newcastle and Norwich uh, are both doing that at the moment. And Liverpool and Tottenham obviously famously reversed their decisions after there was quite a backlash. Uh, in and around these conversations has been the point that football sometimes takes what is seen to be an unfair amount of spotlight uh, when a, a national crisis like this, this is taking place or footballers who are earning large amounts of money which might pale in comparison to, to the executives of, uh, of uh, big tech companies for example or tech companies that don't, don't pay their, uh, their taxes in the UK or elsewhere for example football being more popular takes, uh, takes a lot of the shit basically I wonder if, um, if in Germany the Bundesliga is conscious of that as well because as the country and as countries around the world ease their lockdown procedures we've heard examples of I think there was an island I can't remember the name of it but an island of, um, of, of Japan which had about 2 million people living on it which tried to ease its lockdown restrictions a little too early and had a huge surge in cases re-locked down again do you think the Bundesliga might be nervous at all that if that were to happen in Germany and if, if, if this was taking one step too soon that football might actually in the same way as it has done in the UK be in the limelight there and in the years to come when they make documentaries about this the idea of restarting the football even behind closed doors will be the footage that they use to explain how it all went wrong do you know what I mean? Yeah I know what you mean but I think they're more likely to use the footage of the games when they were still going on in mid-March just to to show what went wrong you know Leipzig playing uh, Tottenham was the last big game in German football being played in in a full stadium um now, we haven't seen suggestions, uh, at least to my knowledge, that this was acting as an accelerator to cases in London or in um, in Leipzig. But, uh, of course, it's impossible to to discount uh, the, you know, the possibility that it might n not have helped, to put it. To put it mildly, um, the Bundesliga are wary, of course. I think they're less wary of being themselves a factor in a second wave. I think the, the people involved are too small and the testing regime is too tight and too restrictive to, to see them as, um, as a potential source of a second wave. But they're wary, of course, of the other things that you talked about, of, of not being seen as, 
um, um, uh, as an industry because of the money and the con political connection that it has that puts itself um, ahead of others. And one of the interesting arguments uh, put forward by Christian Seifert, the uh, Bundesliga CEO at the press conference um, 10 days ago, was to say, look, we might sound as if we're sort of really uh, pushy here, you know, trying to bring football back. But every big company in Germany is trying to devise plans to come back. And he basically hinted at the idea that um, whether you're a car factory or a hotel or, you know, an office, um, somebody met some of these measures, which now sound kind of um, slightly outrageous and, and strange that the Bundesliga are trying to adopt off the pitch will become common uh, and will become sort of part of the, the landscape. And um, it is quite likely that, um, you know, big car factory, uh, big car uh, companies will try to have their own testing for people working at the uh, the shop floor. Uh, the offices might have certain, um, you know, restrictions uh, to make sure there's less contact, even though the office will be open. All these things, I think, will become part of everyday life and uh, the Bundesliga have to be careful not to be seen sort of to, to move too quickly but I think we only perceive it that way and I would say that in their defense because they are planning sort of four weeks eight weeks 12 weeks in advance and we see their plans uh, much more clearly and they're under the floodlight as it were rather than the stuff that happens in normal companies in normal industries which is of less attention. You know, one of the key differences for me between the UK and Germany has been how vocal um, Christian Seifert has been compared with Richard Masters. Um, because it's almost the Premier League CEO, Seb, yeah? Yeah, because I, it's almost as if everything we've heard um, from the Premier League's angle has been either secondhand information or innuendo via the press. I just want to see how Rafa felt that uh, Christian Seifert had dealt with this, given that he's been a, like a, a bit of a figurehead for the Bundesliga's attempt to come back, how he comes across in public. I think Seifert has done a, a very good job at m managing the crisis. I think the difference in visibility is not just one because of sort of personal style or, or preference, etc., or p different characters involved. It, I think it also reflects the the underlying need to come back. The Premier League are in a relatively comfortable position, having received all the domestic TV money already in, Feb in February. Um, there is, of course, another payment due for July for next season. And if the football doesn't come back, then, uh, you know, trouble starts. But the Bundesliga are in a much more precarious situation, um, having still to wait for the last part of the TV money, at least they did, until uh, they reached an agreement for some of the money to be paid on the 1st of May, and then um, more chunks of that last payment being paid out as the games come back. But before that, basically March and April, there is no money coming in, zero. And that's why the, the need to, to explain the Bundesliga's case, uh, to sort of lobby the public to lobby the politicians to lobby the media was much greater than in the Premier League who had a bit more of a of a of a leeway if you will uh, to come back and that's why Seifert had to be quite visible had to be quite um proactive in, in taking that lead and I think he's he's done quite well he's been really um, impressive really impressive he's, he's very impressive um he's not necessarily be I think somebody who can um, sort of touch people emotionally. I think he's a little bit too uh, too dry and too serious for that. But I think he's done a well enough job of explaining to the relevant uh, stakeholders. It's an ugly word, but it's probably the right one. Why the Bundesliga needs to be given every opportunity it can within the ex existing um, setup to try to come back. And I think that um, even the fans who oppose the idea of uh, behind closed doors game in principle, even they, I think, ultimately believe that the Bundesliga don't really have much choice.
dry, unemotional, uh, but good at explaining things. It sounds a lot like Alex Stewart to me. Uh, <laughs> Rafa, let me ask you, on the basis, like, moving from your, your point about the Bundesliga uh, and the financial situation being more extreme currently than it is uh, for the Premier League, I would like to ask you about, um, I think it was Borussia Dortmund's CEO said that if football doesn't come back soon or the, the Bundesliga is in, is in risk of um, collapse, is that, is that a fair comment? It depends how do you define soon. I think if you um, you know think about football coming back some stage in in the summer, I think most clubs would survive that. If this this extended uh, break continues into into autumn, I think most clubs would would have severe problems. Uh, the money that uh, they're supposed to receive is already spent. Uh, it's already budgeted. Um, it's very, very difficult, even for Bayern Munich and Dortmund, to go four or five months without any real income. Of course, some of the sponsorship, some of the commercial money is still coming in, but even that will be tied to games being seen on television. So uh, there'll be huge problems. And, you know, some people have seen what Watzke said as, as, um, as kind of a threat or um, as pulling, pulling at the strings, you know, trying to convince people how... how difficult the situation is but I think he is ultimately right I think there is a lot of problem uh, and that the smaller the club is and the less they are able to rely on non TV rights income and non um, gate receipts income which of course is, is another issue here um, the less they're able to weather the storm and the DFL themselves think that if this last TV payment hasn't been made uh, wouldn't wouldn't have been made in, in in early May 13 out of the 36 Bundesliga professional Bundesliga teams in, in Division 1 and 2 would have serious problems with liquidity and this is just for this payment so if you then go forward and then think about the next season uh, starting very late or starting without money, without fans, then we're running into real problems. And I don't think the Bundesliga is very different in that respect to, to most leagues. Um, the only difference, I think, is that they don't have investors who could maybe foot the bill and, uh, and um, absorb these losses themselves. Uh, these clubs have to be self-sustainable and it's, gone, and it's very, very difficult to see how they could do that once the the tap is is closed for for any income coming in. Thirty now thirty six is is a terrifying statistic. Um, so on that basis, let's say hypothetically th there were continued problems, and I, and I'm not sure again, not medical professional, but I, I'm half expecting there to be a second lockdown later this year as countries ease their current lockdowns, and then the number of cases goes back up again, and we might be in a bit of a, a holding pattern or a cycle in that regard and, until such a time um, as, a, as, a, as a vaccine can be created. That's one uh, possible scenario. In that scenario, where football obviously cannot be played for certain parts throughout the year, if the uh, financial uh, difficulties that uh, were being experienced by Bundesliga clubs became much more difficult and the smaller clubs that were more vulnerable to lack of gate receipts and stuff like that uh, became harder and harder, do you think that there would be... Um well, I suppose we can assume that there probably would be more of an exerted push for a European Super League, particularly from a club like Bayern, as an example of the biggest uh, German football club. D does, does this situation sort of play into to that hand a little bit? It might well do. I think, first of all, um, that would be the second step. I think the first step, and this is something, again, that Vatska talked about, would be the appearance of White Knights. There would be suddenly a lot of people, um, legitimate businessmen and perhaps otherwise, to say, you know what, and you need a lot of money. I like Schalke and Othea. I don't want you to go bust. Here's 100 million, but I want half of the club. Under the guise of social responsibility, in a way, right? Sorry, say again? Faux benevolence, basically. I don't even think there would be any pretense of any, any benevolence or social responsibility. It'd be a basic, a hard nosed, uh, transactional, uh, deal here. You are, um, Ill, you are, um, insolvent. You need money to keep going. Here's the money, but I want control. And up until now, of course, that was impossible to do it, at least in these uh, extreme terms under the 50 plus one rule, which guarantees uh, the clubs to have the ultimate control when it comes to, um, to being in charge of the team. 
but it's very, very conceivable that, um, you know, with half the league or maybe three quarters of the league having no money to pay for their existing players and probably no market to sell them on either, would have to then go and raise money. And the money would come from people who want to take over the club. Um, so I think that is the very ugly but very possible scenario that we might be faced with. And then, of course, the second step would be... Um, why not maximize the income? Um, we might lose a few Bundesliga clubs. We might only be left with 10 um, rather than have half a league. Why not see if we can find 10 other teams from around Europe or 20 other teams and make it to European leagues? And this way we can maybe survive the next few years. So I hope it won't come to that point. I hope that um, even if a second lockdown happens, that football by itself is will be seen as as robust enough to deal with that, having sort of set up its own uh, risk minimizing strategies and, and testing people all the time that we prevent a total lockdown with no games being staged. But of course, um, there is there is that that danger. Um, I think the hope in Germany, by the, by by and large, is that come the same time next year so 12 months from now there will be a vaccine in place of some sort so I, I guess that the worst worst case scenario is is another 12 months of of severe disruption and maybe that is just short enough a window for clubs to secure some kind of bridge loan or you know financing from others without having to sell out completely but there is i think that danger and i think it's a danger that's not being fully understood and appreciated by some of the public Mm, yeah. Hey, well, listen, before we let you go, I would just like to say that uh, I listened to, to, well, some of your recent episodes of the, the Stylecast uh, or the po podcast about Bundesliga for The Athletic, um, and I particularly enjoyed your interview with Mesut Ozil's agent. I thought that was fascinating, particularly what he said from the perspective of um, the players as it relates to clubs asking for wage deferrals or, or wage cuts and stuff. I thought that was very interesting. I, I hadn't considered that perspective before. He believes in it really passionately as well. That really comes across in the podcast. He really defends the corner of the players in that negotiation. It's really interesting. Yeah, and another point he made was that the Bundesliga had handled it a lot more smoothly. He has players in the Bundesliga and in the Premier League. And I think he uh, was saying that the Bundesliga have been a lot more transparent. They're saying, look, uh, while the time we're not playing, this is how much money we're losing per month. This is how much money we need to keep going without having to sack any of our non-playing staff. If you defer your wages for two or three months, if you take a 10% pay cut for two or three months, we can all, as a family, if you will, or as a club, go get through this and come out the other side without having to let people go. And I think that's... The reason, by and large, why we've seen very smooth and very quick agreements um, taking place between players uh, and the clubs in the Bundesliga. And I think the inference was that some Premier League clubs uh, might be using the coronavirus crisis as a convenient excuse just to cut wages, especially if wages are cut for the whole season um, in a situation where, you know, football might be back in six, seven months, even with fans. Uh, but to cut it for a whole 12 months, as, as, as Arsenal, for example, have suggested, I think is is much harder to, to argue um, than having a, a, a much more sort of concrete um, proposal that shows you exactly how much money the clubs need to save and what kind of losses they would incur and uh, and I think it's a it's a very valid point. Yeah, I think, do you know what, uh, you know, now is a is a time rife for opportunists, I would say. Hey, last time you were on the podcast, Rafa, well, there was a video of it and uh, you were wearing a really cool run DMC jumper. I can't see you now, but are you wearing a cool jumper? Uh, that's for others to judge, but um, <laughs> it is it is a, it's a, just a black sweatshirt. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's but it's classic. nicely cut. Yeah. Hey, well, listen, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, people should go and listen to uh, to the Stylecast because it's, it's really, really interesting. And Jonathan Harding is the coolest guy in the world as well. We've had Jonathan Harding on. We know Jonathan. So, uh, yeah, no, go, go watch him. Go and listen to him even. Great. Thanks, Rafa. Thank you guys for having me. Mm -hmm.